This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. This is a podcast on the Podfix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com. He wasn't always angry, desperate and lost in the wasteland of depression and anger. He was a beautiful baby boy born with ears too big for his head and eyes that didn't quite work right. But he was still beautiful to us. As he grew older, he became a handsome young man who valued honesty and integrity and simply didn't understand why so many things in the world were so messed up. He still wanted things to be better and different. What prompts a seemingly normal teenager to do something so out of character it leaves an entire community reeling with grief and fear? Why do we frequently uncover, once it's too late, there's darkness brewing under the surface? Does it amaze us to learn some are shocked by stories like this one, while others aren't surprised at all, claiming they saw it coming? What do you do about a friend, student, child whom others say, I always thought he'd pull a Columbine? What can you do when no one shares their suspicions until after blood has been shed? I'm Dina Marie, your host on this Twisted Journey. Welcome to Twisted Philly. There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome Welcome to to Twisted Philly. Philly. There are commonalities about small towns in Pennsylvania. The rolling green hills, sleepy little bedroom communities surrounded by farmland, the clip-clop of an Amish buggy rolling along past cars and trucks. As you drive through parts of Pennsylvania, the towns can easily blend into one another. If it wasn't for town markers and county lines, you'd think you were still in the same city. If you're not in Philadelphia or Harrisburg, It's easy to get lost in the similarity of the landscape in this state. These little towns have their challenges. Some have less opportunities than other parts of Pennsylvania. Higher unemployment rates, less high-paying jobs. However, the city of Mannheim is a little different. It's more upscale than some of its neighboring communities, with one of the best school districts in the county. It's a middle-to-upper-middle-class suburb that seldom has to cope with murder. Murder is the sort of crime reserved for big cities. That's what the Philly News Networks show us. Shootings almost every day. Yet, as we've heard on so many episodes of Twisted Philly, there's just as much twisted shit happening in cow country as there is in the concrete jungle. We're back in Lancaster County, in the town of Mannheim, Pennsylvania, another small community where most people know one another, And if you don't know them personally, you know someone who knows them, or worked with them, or maybe sold them a car. Mannheim has an unexpected claim to fame, the Mannheim Auto Auction. A friend of mine bought a Saab there about 10 years ago. It was a late model at the time, gorgeous, and he got it dirt cheap. Some, although not all of the cars there, were confiscated by police, so you could be buying a vehicle that was once used in the perpetration of a crime. Mannheim Auto Auction is the largest vehicle remarket auction in the country. They claim in the world, but I'm on the fence about that. It is pretty damn cool, though, and if you have the chance, you should take a ride out just to watch. One of these days, I'm going to head out there and see if they've got any Carmen Gias. I've had some listeners and less than favorable reviewers ask why I spend so much time talking about towns in Pennsylvania. I want you to see these towns. I want you to picture yourself driving along the Pennsylvania Turnpike for miles, past farmhouses and cornfields, past the beautiful mountains and billboards with Bible proverbs, phone numbers you can call to help stop the puppy mills that plague our state. I want you to smell the cow shit and chocolate, depending on which way the wind blows. 
I want to create a picture in your mind of a community going along with its daily routine. Kids catching the school bus, mom and dad heading off to work, whether it's at a big skyscraper downtown or a local preschool. I want you to imagine a town where folks seldom lock their doors and neighbors still knock on a Saturday afternoon to borrow a cup of sugar. I want you to learn to love this state and our cities. For all our faults and flaws and our twisted tales, I want you to see Philadelphia and Pennsylvania through my eyes. I also want you to see a young man. He's 16 years old. He has medium brown hair. It's the sort of brown that can look lighter or darker depending on the sunlight. It's cut short, very short, in fact, over his ears and around the back of his head. It's a little thicker up top and a little spikier up top, too. He has a long, rectangular face, angled cheekbones, and ears that are just a little too big for his head, although his father says he grew into them. He's an attractive young man with a little facial hair, a few days' growth of a mustache and goatee. When I look at him, he reminds me of a lacrosse player, athletic-looking but not bulky and muscular like someone who might play football. And quite honestly, that vision is a stereotype in my head. He looks like an average 16-year-old high school boy. Do you have a picture in your mind yet? It may not look exactly like the boy I described. You might have a similar boy. I want you to imagine that boy on a warm, late spring night in May. It's the sort of evening where you feel summer is just around the corner, yet the air is still crisp. He's wearing a blue windbreaker over a dark hoodie, jeans, dark shoes, and a baseball cap. The boy is walking in the dark through neighboring backyards. It's late, later than you might expect to see a teenage boy out walking in the dark. Perhaps he's on his way home from a friend's house, and he decided to cut through the yards for a faster trip home, rather than follow the tree-lined streets. But he's not headed home. This boy is on a mission. He's hunting for a particular house, set a little bit back from the road, shrouded in trees. It's gray and white and stone, although the colors are hard to distinguish in the dark, and he knows where it is. It's a place he's been many times since he was eight or nine years old. He finds the back door unlocked exactly as he expected and quietly lets himself in. He doesn't turn on any lights because he knows his way around this house so well, he moves easily from room to room in the dark. The boy makes his way up the stairs. He opens one of the bedroom doors. He has a knife in his hand. He brought it from home. He brought the knife with intent and premeditation. The boy attacks a man and woman sleeping in their bed, leaves the room, and heads down the hall to their son's room. What he doesn't know is their daughter is home from college. She hears the commotion and slips into her parents' room while the boy is down the hall. Her mother, barely alive, tells her to run. Run and get help. Get out of the house. And she listens. She flees undetected by the intruder in her home. He's occupied with her brother, whom he kills. The boy doubles back to the room where the man and woman were sleeping. There he finds the woman on the floor, still alive. So he finishes her off. He slips out of the house through a set of sliding glass doors and disappears into the night. That boy was Alec Kreider. And on Saturday morning, May 11th, 2007, Alec murdered his best friend, Kevin Haynes, and Kevin's parents, 50-year-old Tom and 47-year-old Lisa Haynes. Kevin's sister Maggie, who recently returned home from college, was spared her family's fate. Alec Kreider did not have an easy time when he came into this world. Before he was even a year old, Alec underwent surgery on his eyes due to an issue from birth. According to his father, Tom Kreider, it was a constant struggle to get him to wear his glasses when he was young. Alec also struggled socially. He didn't make friends easily and grappled with anger issues as a young boy and a teenager. 
These issues became worse as Alec grew into adolescence and often presented themselves in the way Alec Kreider interacted with his younger brother. To his family, Alec's behavior didn't seem like what some would describe as normal sibling rivalry or horseplay. Alec sometimes became so enraged with his brother during simple family game nights or while the two were playing video games, he came close to choking his younger brother. Tom Kreider and his wife Angela Parsons divorced in 2002 when Alec was 11. They shared joint custody of their three children, one week with mom, one week with dad. And although their parents were no longer together, from everything I've read, it seems Alec's parents had an effective co-parenting relationship. Alec and his siblings came from a decent home before the divorce and were supported by two loving homes after the divorce. Regardless, Alec's anger issues, coupled with emotional struggles and bouts of depression, plagued him for years after the divorce, all the way into high school. He did have a small, close circle of friends. Alec Kreider wasn't described as a loner. He was described as reserved and different. He played soccer for a few years, then his interests changed, and he studied martial arts. Alec learned German in high school, and towards the end of his sophomore year, he was getting ready for a trip to Germany with his class over the summer. He planned on rooming with his best friend Kevin Haynes while they were in Europe. Alec and Kevin had been friends since they were little, at least as far back as the fourth grade. Both boys were academically talented and pulled good grades. Alec and Kevin's friendship was a study in opposites. Where Alec was reserved and quiet, sometimes even described as dark and brooding, Kevin Haynes was sociable, outgoing, funny, and happy. He was always happy. So was his family. You often hear about perfect families, and while I can't tell you the Haynes were a perfect family, I can tell you they were a happy family. Their daughter, Maggie, was in her second year at Bucknell University. Their 16-year-old son, Kevin, did well in school. He was active in clubs, and he had other friends besides Alec. Tom Haynes was a successful industry supply salesman, and his wife, Lisa, Kevin's mother, taught at a local preschool. Kevin had a good relationship with his parents and with his sister. There was very little teenage angst in their home. Their household was a happy one, and it's a home where Alec Kreider spent considerable time growing up as did Kevin spend time at Alec's parents' house, along with a third friend named Warren. Alec's father, Tim, called the boys the Three Musketeers. According to Alec's father, the boys ate lunch together almost every day. They went fishing together. They participated in Boy Scouts when they were little. The boys played video games and hung out after school as teenagers. There was absolutely nothing in their friendship that had gone wrong. It wasn't like what some children experience as they move from elementary to middle school or junior high and then high school when friends drift apart, sometimes they form new alliances or distance themselves from old acquaintances. Alec and Kevin especially maintained their close relationship throughout all the transitions kids go through as they grow up. The Kreider family learned of the murders of Kevin Haynes and his parents on Saturday afternoon, May 11th. Alec's family was devastated. His parents knew the Haynes. Their children had been best friends for ages. Alec's older sister and younger brother were also close with Kevin. His father, Tim Kreider, sometimes talked about running with Kevin's father, Tom. Both families were preparing for the boys' trip to Germany that summer. Alec's mother, Angela, saw the headlines while she was out picking up newspapers for her paper delivery job. She called home to Alec to tell him about the murder of his best friend and realized Alec already knew. A friend from high school called to tell him, but he didn't believe it. For Alec's family, learning people they knew and loved were brutally murdered was devastating. It was also terrifying because that meant a killer was loose in Mannheim, Pennsylvania, a town where the usual crimes were speeding tickets, underage drinking, and maybe some petty thefts. So what happened? On Friday night, May 10th, 2007, the Haynes family had dinner together. Maggie Haynes was home from Bucknell University. Her brother Kevin and her parents Lisa and Tom enjoyed listening to Maggie talk about her experiences at college. After dinner, Maggie and her mother stepped out to rent a few movies, and the Haynes spent most of the evening watching TV together. After the movies, Lisa and Kevin went to bed, while Maggie and her father Tom stayed up a little later to watch the end of the Phillies game. After the game, they too went to bed. Around 2.15 a.m. on Saturday morning, May 11, Maggie awoke to the sound of noises and yelling. The noises sounded like something banging on the floor or against a wall. 
She left her bedroom and crept down the hall to her parents' room, where she found her father lying on the bed, and sitting next to him slumped over was her mother. Lisa Haynes was still alive at that point. She told Maggie to get out and get help. Maggie didn't know what happened. She had no idea her parents had been attacked, only that something was wrong. She did what her mother said. She ran from the home to a neighbor's house across the street where she pounded and pounded on the door to wake up her neighbor. Once inside, they called 911. Maggie said there was something wrong in her house, but she didn't know what it was. Mannheim Township Police arrived a little after 2.30 in the morning, about 20 minutes after the attack began and 10 minutes after Maggie called 911. Two police officers asked Maggie what happened. She told them she thought there could be an intruder or maybe something was wrong with her father, but whatever it is, her mother pleaded with her to get help. The police crossed the street to the Haynes house. They rang the bell, but no one answered. They tried a second time, and they asked Maggie why no one came to the door. She assured them her family was inside, so the officers let themselves into her house. By the time the Mannheim police entered the home, Lisa, Tom, and Kevin Haynes were dead, and the killer was gone. Tom Haynes was found lying on his bed. He died from a stab wound to the chest. He was also stabbed in the leg. Lisa Haynes was found on the floor in front of the bed. She died from a stab wound to the abdomen, although her throat had also been cut, but most likely that occurred after Maggie found her and Lisa told her to run for help. 16-year-old Kevin was stabbed multiple times in the neck and chest. Kevin was found in the hallway just outside his bedroom. He had defensive wounds on his hands and arms, indicating he fought his attacker but ultimately succumbed to over two dozen stab wounds that were so severe a portion of his throat had been cut out. All three were taken to Lancaster General Hospital, where they were pronounced dead. A third officer on the scene, a 17-year veteran named Ray Bradley, spoke with Maggie Haynes. He carried the burden of telling Maggie her parents and brother were dead. Officer Bradley asked Maggie if there was anyone they could call, were there friends or family who could come and stay with her, help her through this unbelievable night. The officer called Maggie's aunt and uncle and then told her she had to come to the police station for questioning. As you might imagine, Mannheim police were surprised Maggie Haynes' entire family was murdered the day after she came home from college, yet she managed to escape. The questioning started out innocently enough. Mannheim detectives asked Maggie about school. How long had she been home? Did she have a boyfriend? She didn't. They asked Maggie to describe in detail what happened. When did she wake up? What were the noises she heard? Could she describe them? Where were they coming from? What did she see in her parents' room? Why didn't she check her brother's room? Which door did she use when she ran out of the house? The police found Maggie's demeanor somewhat disturbing. She transitioned from crying to speaking calmly. She said she wished she never came home from school. She talked about an upcoming opportunity to study abroad that she had recently discussed with her parents. At times, the police described her as a typical, self-absorbed teenager. There's no rule book for something like this. There are entirely too many expectations around how people should behave when they learn their loved ones were murdered. Plus, Maggie was running on adrenaline. She was afraid when she heard yelling and what sounded like a fight. She was scared when her mother told her to run and get help. She was anxious waiting for the police to arrive. Yet often police and the infamous they seem to have an easy time judging someone's guilt or innocence by the way a person responds to trauma. And we've all done it. You watch Investigation Discovery or 2020, you listen to true crime podcasts, and you make an assessment, I know I do, about how someone should react upon learning devastating news. But the more I dig into stories like this one, the more I realize there are a thousand different ways people react because in these moments it is a pure emotional visceral reaction Mannheim police gave Maggie Haynes a laptop and told her to type her statement to the best of her recollection while she typed officers and detectives continued to scrutinize her behavior every pause 
every head tilt, every glance. It all meant something to the detectives, although in reality it might have meant absolutely nothing. Imagine sitting in front of a computer in a police station, typing up your memories of what happened just moments before your family was murdered. I have a feeling any one of us would glance around the room instead of face the task of writing those words. Whomever murdered the Haynes did a lousy job cleaning up. Bloody footprints were found in the upstairs bathroom, where the killer also left blood drops in the sink. There were bloody footprints in the carpet at the bottom of the staircase, and another set in front of the sliding glass doors leading out from the house. The doors were still open when investigators arrived at the Haynes house to scrutinize the crime scene. Kevin Haynes' room was the worst part of the house. There was blood on every wall, on the windows, and on the floor, on every piece of furniture in his bedroom. A trail of blood led from Kevin's window to the hallway just outside his bedroom door, where his body was found. There was a stark contrast between how Kevin was murdered and the condition of his bedroom and the murders of his parents. Tom and Lisa Haynes were stabbed. Their wounds were killing wounds, but each of them were only stabbed twice. Kevin suffered dozens of stab wounds. He fought his attacker. He struggled. And that struggle was evident by blood evidence on almost every surface in his room. The attack on Kevin was savage, and that led police to believe he was ultimately the intended target. Meanwhile, the police continued questioning Maggie Haynes. They questioned her aunt and uncle, who were also at the station with her. Did they have any idea who could have done this? There was no discord in the family. Maggie's aunt and uncle talked to Tom and Lisa just a few days before the murder. They were as happy as ever, happy with one another, with their children, their jobs. Tom was recovering from a recent surgery, and his recovery was going well. In the days after the murder, Mannheim and Pennsylvania State Police questioned friends and associates of the Haynes, co-workers at both Lisa and Tom's places of employment. Everyone with whom they spoke said the same thing. The Haynes were a happy, loving family. Lisa taught at a preschool, and while some of her fellow teachers may not have been close with her, their at-work relationships were positive and pleasant. Lisa seemed very happy with her teaching position, and Tom was a successful salesman who was respected by his boss and his co-workers. They questioned Kevin Haynes' teachers and friends. No one could imagine any reason why someone would want to murder this family. And it was a miracle Maggie escaped. While she wasn't considered a suspect, the police weren't ruling out the possibility she knew more than she initially shared. Although if she did, it was most likely because she was in a state of shock and she simply didn't remember. If Maggie wasn't the killer or wasn't in some way connected to the murders, her safety was then also a concern. So the police provided protection for Maggie. She was accompanied by a police officer anywhere she went for the first few weeks after her family's murder. While they were investigating the crime scene, Mannheim police brought in scent dogs to the Haynes residence, hoping to pick up a scent of the killer. The dogs tracked what their handler called a fear scent for over a mile, and then lost the scent when it ended at a convenience store. Now, the police thought that meant the killer or killers fled the Haynes home on foot and must have had a car waiting for them nearby at that convenience store. And that made it less likely Maggie Haynes killed her family. Forensic investigators went over every inch of the Haynes residence. They vacuumed the carpets, hoping to gather any sort of trace evidence. They tested every surface for blood and for prints. They took shoe prints from the bloody footprints leaving the home. These shoe prints became a significant piece of evidence in the case. Mannheim police contacted the FBI in Harrisburg, who worked with the FBI in Philly, to identify the type of shoes the killer wore. The soles matched a particular pattern of hush puppy loafers. At every step of the investigation, the police demonstrated an incredible attention to detail, yet they had very little evidence that in any way led them to a suspect, although they were able to more clearly identify the actions the murderer took once he or she were inside the home. And unlike what we hear in some other cases where law enforcement gets territorial, Mannheim police solicited help from the state police and the FBI. They wanted as many people as possible to assist in finding the Haynes killers and bringing them to justice. For weeks, Mannheim police and the Pennsylvania State Police followed tips and leads that went nowhere. 
Suddenly, everyone saw something. Everyone heard something that had to be connected to the Haynes murders. Neighbors reported they heard screams in the early hours of the morning on Saturday, May 11th, but thought it was someone's television. Anyone that looked different was suddenly considered suspicious by the residents of Mannheim, Pennsylvania. Perhaps the strangest report of all was from a New Jersey psychic who told police she had visions of the murderer, a tall, thin teenage boy named Troy, who had blonde streaks in his hair and wore jeans with dark red patches on the ass when he committed the murder. There was another story of a young man in a juvenile detention center who claimed he knew who committed the murders, a friend of his who was looking to rob the homes of what he perceived as rich families. The police followed this person of interest, but ultimately neither one of them had anything to do with the murders. Some people have a warped sense of celebrity and will do anything, even claim to have helped clean up a crime scene, for their 15 minutes of fame. On Saturday, May 19th, a memorial service was held for Kevin, Tom, and Lisa Haynes. So many of Kevin's classmates were there, including Alec Kreider and his family. Lisa Haynes' brother spoke at the service. He spoke about Kevin and his parents. He talked about how devastating their deaths were to anyone who knew them. And he had a message for the killer, both at the beginning and the end of his eulogy. If the person who did this is here, we would like to ask the person or persons responsible for this to come forward and admit what they've done. The person responsible for this crime is probably in this room. If that is the case, do the right thing. Come forward. At the end of the service, Alec Kreider, along with students from his German class at Mannheim Township High School, participated in a meeting with a counselor sponsored by the church. After the counseling session, his family remarked on his agitated state. He was furious, and he complained about kids from school who didn't really care about Kevin. They bullied him, they made fun of him, and now they were crying over his death. He called his peers hypocrites. Alec's family feared for his ability to handle the death of his best friend. He was already in a fragile emotional state, suffering from depression and frequent outbursts of anger. His parents sought assistance for his depression before. Alec was even prescribed medication to help balance his moods and control his anger. And he hated it. He hated the way it made him feel. The medication caused memory issues. It made it hard for him to concentrate in school. Alec's father, Tim Kreider, made a deal with him. Keep your anger in check, and you don't have to take the medication. In hindsight, his father realized that wasn't the best solution. A darkness fell over Alec. It was something he struggled with every day. All he wanted was for the pain, hurt, and anger to end. On Sunday, May 20th, the day after the Haynes Memorial Service, two Pennsylvania State Police officers interviewed Alec Kreider a second time. The first interview occurred just a few days after the murders, and that meeting didn't give police any reason to be concerned about Alec. In the days leading up to the funeral, though, police began to hear rumors about Alec Kreider, along with a few other students at Mannheim Township High School, that they were interested in Nazism. And it was these rumors that prompted police to interview Alec a second time. The state police asked Alec a number of questions about his friendship with Kevin. How often did he sleep at Kevin Haynes' house? When was the last time he spoke to Kevin? Alec talked to Kevin on Friday, May 10th after school, the afternoon before the murders. It had been about a month since Alec Kreider had been at Kevin's house. Next, the police asked Alec if Kevin had any trouble in school with bullying. Did Kevin have any enemies? What did he do online? Was there anyone Alec could think of who would want to hurt Kevin? Alec Kreider told the state police Kevin was sometimes picked on because he was, as Alec put it, a nerd and he gave police the names of a few older students they may want to question. Before they left, the state police had just one more question for Alec Kreider. They told him they'd heard the rumors about Alec being interested in Nazism and wanted to know if they were true. Alec calmly and definitively told officers the rumors were absolutely not true. When they asked why he thought people would say that about him, Alec said it might have been because he was very interested in Germany the language and the culture, he and Kevin were supposed to go on a school trip to Germany that summer. Maybe people weren't able to separate someone's interest in a country and a culture with a dark history of that country. And that was it. Alec Kreider answered their questions. There was nothing that gave the police signals he was hiding anything. In fact, they felt Alec was very cooperative. 
Days passed. Weeks passed. The community of Mannheim, Pennsylvania, tried to regain some sense of normalcy, but it was damn near impossible. Teenagers set up booby traps around their beds, so if anyone broke into their home and tried to kill them, like their friend Kevin Haynes, they would wake up and be able to scream for help. According to Lancaster Online News, security alarm sales went up 600% after the Haynes murders. People were scared, and they stopped leaving their doors unlocked. For a brief time, Alex Kreider seemed to bounce back from the death of his best friend. He had difficult days, but he also had good days, too. A few female friends from school formed something like a little club around him to cheer him up. He asked his dad if he could help plant flowers in the gardens outside their house. He started practicing his martial arts moves again, and he came out of his bedroom a little more often than immediately after Kevin's murder. It would take time, but Alex's father remembered feeling as if there was hope again. Before we go on with part one of this story, I'd like to take a few minutes and tell you about an incredible new sponsor we have here at Twisted Philly. It's an independent business that sells essential oils, whom I just discovered before the holidays, and I'm sort of addicted to their products. The company is called Frankie and Mar. It's aromatherapy made fun, and they've got a special 15% discount exclusively for Twisted Philly listeners. Let me first tell you a little bit about the company. Frankie and Murr was started by a social worker in Oakland, California, who wanted, and I'm quoting, a readily available coping method for stress, something that didn't include Valium or whiskey. Can you tell why I love this company? She toiled, studied organic chemistry, and created the greatest essential oil blends I've ever used. I've tried for ages to get my daughter to use essential oils and aromatherapy, and she thinks it's some sort of weird premenopausal treatment. Yeah, thanks, kid. Well, Frankie and Mar changed her mind. Not only are their blends some of the most incredible, pure, and rich scents I've ever used, their product names are badass. I made my first purchase just in time for Christmas, and I bought the Bitch Kit Bundle. Yeah, that's what it's called. As if I needed to know anything other than the name of Bitch Kit. Maybe I'm spraying away my own bitchiness or some bitch vibe someone's brought into my personal space. The blend is a mix of clary sage, rose geranium, bergamot, and lavender essential oils. The scent is pure heaven and no joke, my mood is instantly lifted when I use it. The bundle comes with three different products. Spray the Bitch Away is a light aromatherapy spray. You shake it up, spray a few spritzes into the air, walk through it, and I am totally serious when I tell you that instantly you feel serene. The second product in the kit is Roll the Bitch Away. It's a roll-on essential oil that is perfect for your pressure points. The last part of the Bitch Kit is the traditional essential oil blend that you use in a diffuser or, let's say you make your own soap, you could toss a few drops in. My kid, who didn't want anything to do with aromatherapy, took the roll-on and the essential oil, damn it. Suddenly, because of Frankie and Mar, she's a believer in essential oils. Their products come in all sorts of combinations. You don't have to buy a bundle. You can buy a single essential oil or a spray, but I really love the bundle kit. There are so many different blends, including 40 Winks to help you have a great night's sleep, Breath of Fresh Air, which is like a vapor rub essential oil. That's another one we use at my house. So many other incredible combinations. Frankie and Mar is offering an exclusive discount just for Twisted Philly listeners. Go to their website at frankieandmurr.com. That's F-R-A-N-K-I-E-A-N-D-M-Y-R-R-H.com. And use code TWISTED when you check out for a 15% discount. I told Frankie and Mar they have a customer for life in me. And I know that when you check out their website and try your first product, you're going to be a customer for life too. You guys know how I am about sponsors. I'm very picky. It needs to be an independent business and one that I personally patronize and believe in. That's why I'm so thrilled to partner with Frankie and Mar. Be sure to let me know when you order and share pictures of your purchases on Twisted Philly Facebook and Twitter pages. I can't wait to see which essential oils you guys pick out.
On the night of June 5th, Alec Kreider was in his room at his mother's house, on the phone with a female friend. It was a young lady he'd recently met at the mall. During this conversation, he revealed to her he had a gun on him, and he was thinking about hurting himself. Alec's friend was at home with her aunt, and she told her aunt what Alec said. They were both scared for his safety, but neither thought this young woman should end the conversation. So her aunt drove to Alec's house while the young woman stayed on the phone with him. Her aunt knocked on the door, and Alec's mother, Angela, was surprised to see a stranger standing on the other side. Then shocked when the stranger explained her niece was back at her house on the phone with Alec, who had a loaded gun in his room, and threatened to take his own life. Alec's mother called 911. She explained the situation and waited for police to arrive, while Alec's sister sat outside his bedroom listening for signs his emotional state was getting worse. When the police arrived, they moved very slowly and cautiously. They contacted his friend's aunt and asked her to relay messages to her niece, who was still on the phone with Alec. She heard a noise on the other end of the line, and when she asked Alec what it was, he said he cocked the gun just to see what it would feel like. Alec claimed he put the gun to his head and practiced pulling the trigger. As disturbing as that situation was, a young man with a loaded gun considering taking his own life, Alec made statements that were just as frightening about other people. Alec talked about a young woman from his neighborhood, someone who seemed happy all the time. He hated that about her. He called her a bitch and a whore. He dreamed about killing this young woman and killing her family. Alec said he didn't want to live anymore because he was preoccupied with thoughts of killing. He told his friend one time he tried to strangle his brother and wished he would have killed him. Alec's friend, his mother, the police, they all knew the situation grew more desperate as the minutes ticked by. But no one except his friend on the other end of the phone knew about Alec's dark fantasies. Through this young woman's aunt, the police asked her to try and coax Alec out of his room, maybe suggest he get some air or a drink of water. And that's what she did. She suggested he get something to eat, get a drink, anything to take his mind off his sadness in an attempt to get him to put the gun down and leave his bedroom. One of the last sentiments he shared before she was able to convince him to leave his room was that someday he would tell her about something horrible he'd done. That day came sooner than anyone expected. Alec finally gave in to his friend's suggestion and left his bedroom where he was instantly tackled by a SWAT team he had no idea was in his home. The police handcuffed Alec and transported him to Lancaster General Hospital. At the hospital, he was so aggressive and agitated, they were unable to manage him, and he was transferred to the Philhaven Behavioral Facility. Alec was kept on a mandatory 72-hour hold, during which time he was never left unsupervised. When he went to the bathroom, a staff member was there. Shower? Well, the same thing. Staff member stood next to him. Sleeping? Staff member sat in a chair next to his bed, and it was absolutely unnerving. The initial assessment that doctors shared with his parents was that Alec Kreider was a danger to himself and to others. He suffered from severe depression and expressed both suicidal and homicidal thoughts. He was placed on antipsychotic medication. After the 72-hour hold, Alec and his parents Tim and Angela attended a hearing to determine his length of treatment at Philhaven. A judge mandated 10 days of treatment, and then, based on his behavior, the treatment was extended to 21 days. Alec Kreider's parents were able to visit him, and they attended family therapy sessions every week. He wasn't allowed other visitors, no friends, not his siblings or his father's fiance. nor was he allowed to speak with his young female friend who may have saved his life that night on the phone, June 5th, the one who kept him talking while police were waiting outside his bedroom. That was the toughest issue for Alec, not being allowed to speak with that young woman, because while she considered Alec Kreider a good friend, he was in love with her. Alec's parents spoke to his therapist about his feelings for this young woman. They all agreed it would be best to be honest with Alec before his release, so he understood this young woman's position before he went home and tried to profess his love for her. On June 13th, during a family counseling session, Tim explained to Alec this young woman cared for him very much as a friend, but she didn't have romantic feelings for him, and her family expected her to focus on school, not a boyfriend. Alec grew more agitated than his family expected upon hearing this news. They didn't expect it to go over well, but he was so upset he asked his parents to leave the counseling session. A short while later, his therapist called them back into the room. She told Tim and Angela that Alec had something to tell them. Never in a million years did his parents expect what came out of his mouth. Alec looked at his parents, 
and said, I killed Kevin. Initially, neither his mother nor his father believed Alec Kreider. Nor did his therapist. She thought he was looking for attention or projecting the murder onto himself because of the pain he'd been suffering over the loss of his best friend. She asked Alec if it was possible he confused what he'd heard in the news and been told with the depressed feelings inside his head. Alec Kreider made sure they understood he was confessing to murder. I killed Kevin. It, it's true. I'm not making it up. You know how mom works at night? I dressed in dark clothing, a dark coat, and I snuck out. I took a flashlight, I wore gloves, I wore a black cap, and I taped over the logo. These are the shoes I wore that night. I, I felt nothing but rage the whole time. Just rage. Completely out of control. But afterwards, I was scared. I ran from the house filled with intense fear. I did it. Kevin died in the hallway facing the wall. His father laid on the bed with his head hanging over the side. His mother was just a few inches from the doorway on the floor. I ran behind their house. That's where I lost my cap and flashlight because I, I fell in the woods. When I got back to mom's house, I cleaned up. She got home around five and I was still awake. I told her I woke up earlier and I couldn't get back to sleep. They sat in silence. No one knew what to do or what to say. Tim Kreider and his ex-wife Angela Parsons just learned their son murdered three people. They were so stunned they didn't even ask him why. A few minutes after Alec's confession, the hospital administrator appeared and told Tim Kreider, we'll give you some time to do the right thing. That night, Tim told his fiance about the confession. He and his ex-wife had no idea what to do or where to turn. The next day, Tim hired criminal defense attorney John Kenneff to represent Alec. Kenneff met with Tim and Angela, then he traveled to Philhaven to speak with Alec Kreider. He told Alec's parents not to speak to anyone about what their son confessed, including Alec. After Kefner's initial meeting with Alec Kreider, Alec told his father, No one at Philhaven is allowed to tell anyone about my confession, and you can't tell anyone either. Tim Kreider was stunned. As he said in his book about his son's crimes, Refuse to Drown, a parent's first instinct is to protect their children. But what does that mean? when your child commits intentional, premeditated murder. Tim and his fiance met with their pastor, and he prayed for Tim to have the strength to do what needed to be done. What did need to be done? Turn his son over to the police? That's the right thing to do. Alec's parents knew that. And in knowing that, they watched their son's life disappear before their eyes, imagining life in prison without the possibility of parole. They thought of the Haynes, Family friends, their son's best friend, brutally murdered in their beds. And Maggie Haynes left an orphan, the sole surviving member of her family. Tim Kreider admitted he considered options. Could he go on the run with his son? Could he live with himself if he didn't do the right thing? Was there any way he could keep his son from spending his life in prison? As I read his book, I wondered what I would do if I were faced with that same situation. My immediate reaction was, well, I would turn in my child. That's the conversation I had with myself. If my daughter ever did something like this, which I know she would never do, and I'm sure the Criders said those very same statements to themselves. I know they did. Tim said as much in his book. It's nice to picture yourself in someone else's shoes and imagine what you would do or how you would react. But unless you are truly in that situation, I don't think you know with all certainty the actions you would take even when you know they're right. I think any parent would have a fleeting thought about keeping their child out of prison, even though you know that's not an option. And that's where we'll stop for now. I'll leave you with that thought. What would you do? Would you do the right thing and turn your son or daughter over to the police? Will Tim Kreider and Angela Parsons, Alex's parents, do the right thing? And what about Maggie Haynes? big sister to Kevin Haynes, daughter of Tim and Lisa Haynes, the lone survivor of a brutal attack that left her entire immediate family dead. How does Maggie cope with such a loss? We'll talk about all of that and more in part two. I'd like to thank a few special guests you heard in part one. Nick Haskins, 
co-host of the Epic Film Guys podcast and host of the Rester Rant podcast, Jeremy Collins, host of the podcast We Listen To podcast, and Xander Worrell, co-host of Insight Junior. Thank you all so much for your contributions to part one of The Lone Survivor. You'll hear some of these voices and a few other special guests coming up in part two. As always, I'd like to share a very special thank you to Emmy Sarah for the music you heard in this and almost every episode of Twisted Philly. You can find out more about Emmy on her website at emmysarah.com and download her music on iTunes.